All right, folks, this is chapter 15, all about alternative energy resources. And when we're talking alternative energy resources, what I mean is anything that is not coal, oil, or natural gas. Uh, and we'll start off by talking about um, uh, some stuff that's synthetic, coal, oil, natural gas, that kind of stuff, which you wouldn't really normally consider alternative energy, but it actually is because it is not traditional coal, oil, or natural gas. Uh, another term that is important to know in this uh, uh, chapter is green economy. And this is the inevitable uh, conversion of our fossil fuel based society uh, to a sustainable renewable energy society. This is not just some hippie idealistic bullcrap. This is we are going to run out of fossil fuels. We are going to need to switch. Well, I suppose we could take ourselves out in some horrible, terrible nuclear catastrophe. Uh, and in that case, we wouldn't. But, you know, uh, if the human species survives, we will need to uh, continue on with a green economy, which is, of course, going to be dominated by renewable and non-carbon fuels. So let's talk some first non-conventional types of fossil fuels. First of all, there's synthetic fuel that is produced from coal. So gas or liquid fuels produced from coals or heavy oils, as you imagine. Um, this is a, a pretty uh, energy intensive process. Uh, heavy oils, we're talking about heavier molecules, lots of sulfur and sulfides in this stuff. So this is just these heavier, these longer hydrocarbon chains. Uh, this produces less gas, less jet fuel uh, than you know uh, you would want and costs it a lot more to refine. Um, and requires a special extraction method using steam. So you need to heat something up. So you need to have some source of, of you know, energy to, to steam, to drive the, the heating of the steam anyway, right? Uh, and then there's tar sands and oil sands. And I'm sure you've heard about these before. Uh, this is the material they're harvesting is stuff called bitumen. And this is oil where the lighter hydrocarbons have been lost due to bacterial action and migration uh, into the air. So you're left with just a tar or asphalt like substance, those really heavy, long hydrocarbon chains. Uh, if they're mixed near the surface in these, these uh, uh, sands, they're called tar sands or oil sands, right? They're very hard to extract and cost, of course, a lot more to produce than conventional fossil fuels. Another one that people have been looking at are oil shales. This is the source rock itself. So this would be, uh, say, the, the organic rich shale itself. Uh, but this, uh, this shale has not been down into the oil or the natural gas window. Uh, instead, so it doesn't contain oil or natural gas, it contains that original organic kerogen. If you remember from last chapter, then it has to be shoved down to the oil or natural gas window to convert that into the oils and the natural gas. So what we do here is reproduce then the conditions of shoving it way down in the earth by heating up the rock. And this produces changes that kerogen into natural gas and oil and produces a synthetic crude oil. Uh, there's a ton of this stuff over in the Rocky Mountain region, two to, three, two to three trillion barrels, 800 billion of those barrels, pretty recoverable, which is three times greater than the conventional oil reserves in Saudi Arabia. And these are the remains of ancient lake deposits. Uh, a couple of different ways we can uh, take this oil shale and, uh, and, and transform it into synthetic crude oil. The first method is called retorting. And the second one is in situ. And what you see here is the retorting method. And so here you, you mine the rock, you crush it up fine, you put it in this, this giant kiln essentially, which rotates like a, like a dryer uh, at over 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And it transforms these kerogens then into the hydrocarbons. Uh, and then uh, the, you know, the remaining rock is then it drips out, you know, collects at the bottom uh, and you collect the, the, the hydrocarbons. Um, but the issue is here, uh, the heated rock, because now we've crushed it up and there's lots more space in it, right? There's a disposal problem. It's going to occupy about 120% of the original volume. 
So this material won't all fit back in the hole you put, you dug it out of. So what do you do with the extra material? Well, one other way to do this is, is called in situ, which means in place or in the ground. And here we're going to actually send big heaters down into the ground to cook the rock in place. Now this eliminates the disposal issue. Uh, you then, you know, after those carogens are transformed into hydrocarbons, you pump them back up via wells. Uh, but there's an issue of these hydrocarbons then, you know, migrating out and, and polluting nearby, you know, groundwater, streams, lakes, etc. right? Uh, the other issue is here you're not producing those, uh, those lighter hydrocarbons. You're generally producing still heavier hydrocarbons uh, and requires the addition of natural gas in order to create gasoline or jet fuel right uh and historically as you can imagine you know heating the ground or putting all this stuff in a giant kiln this is not very economical however you know uh because of the high cost of heating these shales however whenever oil prices go up right interest grows in this process and of course right now with oil prices at rock bottom pardon the pun uh they're not doing this uh right now right uh, in 2004, uh, the Shell Corporation tried to do uh, another style of in situ uh, uh, method uh, where basically, you know, they took these, these, uh, these heaters again and put them down in the subsurface, but they used lower temperatures. And so rather than extracting within a couple months, it's going to take them several years to start producing. Uh, but then around that, so they'll, they're, they're heating up this rock, and then around that, they're going to ref put refrigerant wells to freeze the rock so it keeps the oil and natural gas that they produce, the hydrocarbons they produce, on site instead of leaking out into the environment, right? Uh, um, but then, you know, the, the other nice thing is because they're doing this slower and it's taking a longer time, it's producing those, those lighter hydrocarbons, so there's no need for natural gas to, to produce gasoline and jet fuel. And here's the area uh, out west in the Rocky Mountain region that would be mined. All of this is where we contain oil shells, the Green River Basin, which is where I do Y research, the Washaki Basin, uh, the Uinta Basin, Pions Creek Basin here, right? Uh, and if this, we do discover a way to economically mine these, all of these areas will be just developed for, for oil shales. Another uh, potential that people have looked at are, are gas hydrates, aka methane hydrates. Uh, these were discovered in the 1970s, and these are basically methane and water molecules bound together in a solid. It's essentially a methane popsicle, if you will. Right? Uh, these live in our seas, shallow and polar, wa polar waters. They like colder temperatures uh, in, in lower latitudes, more close to the equator. Right? They're in the deeper parts off the continental shelf. Uh, but there's also a ton of this stuff uh, stored in our Arctic permafrost. Uh, and this stuff, again, exists only under very certain temperature and pressure conditions. If you disturb it, if you raise the temperature just a little bit, this stuff uh, dissipates and releases the methane, right? So here's a, a picture of, uh, these are methane hydrates that are that are that somebody has lit on fire just to show you how much energy they contain, right? And again, small temperatures uh, and pressure changes can cause these methane gases to release uh, and there is a concern that as global temperatures start to rise, uh, huge amounts of this methane could be released from our oceans and from our, our Arctic permafrost. And the big issue here is, is methane is another greenhouse gas. I know we always talk about carbon dioxide, and that's because carbon dioxide tracks temperature really well, uh, but methane is actually 20 to 25 times more effective of a greenhouse gas then is carbon dioxide and releases of large amounts of of these methane hydrates in the past have been linked to near mass extinctions uh, also there's two times as much carbon stored in these methane hydrates the entire world's uh, traditional fossil fuel supply so releasing these things could be uh issue or problematic right uh, the problem with all of these types we just talked about, these non-traditional synthetic fossil fuels, is you're 
still burning fossil fuels. You're still digging up the sequestered carbon and throwing it into the modern carbon cycle. All right. Same issue as pollution is actually probably even more so. A lot of these things are full of sulfur, takes a lot more energy to extract, uh, and we're not getting, you know, nearly as much back. But if we run out of traditional fossil fuels, this is a way we could sustain, you know, our dependence for a little while. Right? So now let's look at some more traditional uh alternative energies if you will ones you would think of uh, first of all let's look at uh, biofuels right biofuels they are renewable however they are not carbon free right uh, what you're doing is you're you know using these 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 uh, these plants or algae or whatever to create this uh, this biofuel but it's still burning carbon right but the difference is this is modern organic matter this is organic matter this is carbon that is already in the modern carbon cycle right so all you're doing is is taking it from one part of the carbon cycle and putting it to another you're not digging up sequestered carbon and adding carbon to the carbon cycle so using biofuels is basically carbon neutral if you will what you what the plant takes up in life as far as carbon you can burn out back in these biofuels but uh but you won't be adding any net carbon to the uh, the carbon cycle right so again this carbon dioxide is admitted but only what that original plant removed from the atmosphere in the first place a right? couple different kinds of biofuel ethanol right this is uh, ethyl alcohol e85 that kind of stuff right this is made from the fermenting plant material and then we have biodiesel, uh, and this, these are fatty acids uh, from vegetable oils, animal fats, and that kind of thing that are broken down and used to create biodiesel. Hydropower is another renewable energy, right? This is using the stored potential energy, right, as it falls and is converted into kinetic energy. That is used to spin a turbine. That turbine is then used to generate electricity. This is a renewable energy, uh, no carbon dioxide other than what it took to construct the dam itself, right? Uh, and this, of course, requires, you know, dams with deep reservoirs, narrow river valleys with steep sides are usually the best because you need to be able to transform that potential into a good amount of kinetic energy so it must fall a good ways, right? Today, about 16% of the world's electrical production is done through hydropower. Right? Uh, another kind of, uh, of power is nuclear power and here on planet Earth we are currently able to do nuclear fission. This is the splitting of nucleuses and it's the conversion of mass basically into energy. However, this energy itself is not used directly to create electricity, right? Basically, what we're talking here is still 1800s steam engine technology. So heat from this fission reactor, right, is used to steam uh, water, turn water into steam. That steam is used to drive a turbine. That turbine is what creates the electrical power. Right now, the issues, uh, or one of the good things about nuclear power, is you can generate electricity on a, a large, large scale. Right, it creates no or uses up no carbon dioxide, produces no carbon dioxide, no sulfur emissions. Right. However, our current methods produce a large amount of nuclear waste. Right, and this creates disposal issues. What do you do with all this nuclear waste after it's done? Right. You're talking uranium has a half life of I don't know, a couple billion years. So even in, you know, a couple hundred thousand years, it's going to be essentially no less radioactive, right? Another big issue with nuclear power is the stigma that it is dangerous. To, and this has been, you know, kind of heralded by a few different uh, issues. Three Mile Island in New York, and of course, the famous Chernobyl meltdown in Russia, 30 mile radius of that area is still uninhabitable. Right. But then in 2011, in Japan, I don't know, I've shown you pictures of the earthquakes and the tsunami that came along with that. Right. Uh, and that tsunami caused a near meltdown, uh, did release radioactivity, uh, but they were able to stop it before it went into full meltdown mode. Right. 
Another uh, renewable fuel is solar energy, and we can use this in two different ways. Uh, first, we can use it just for heating, right? So passive effect, like a greenhouse effect, right? You set up this this uh, um, uh, greenhouse with the you know the, the glass windows. Uh, light comes in; it transforms to to a, a longer wave light and and can't escape and starts to heat up the greenhouse, right? Now another way you can do it is you have what basically look like solar panels on the top of your house and you have water pipes running through these solar panels and as the water runs through the solar panels it heats up the water uh, and that's called active solar heating. Now the other way we can use solar power is to create solar energy right, through photovoltaic cells and this is where we transform that solar energy directly into electrical energy uh, in the uh, um, in the solar panels right uh, so they do unfortunately have a limited ability to store electricity so you need some sort of capacitor or, or something to store it uh, but you can also if you're producing more electricity than using you can watch your your electrical meter run backwards as you sell uh, electricity back to the public utility company that would be kind of cool Wind power, another big one I know we're all familiar with. This is using the kinetic energy of wind. It is renewable. It is no carbon dioxide except for what it took to, to set the, you know, to produce and set up the windmills, all right? Uh, and it's easily converted into electricity because the wind blades turn the turbine itself. So the turbine is in here, right? The largest of these ever was 443 feet tall with a 413 foot diameter rotor. That is a massive thing. And it had a, a turbine basically the size of the school bus uh, on the back of it. Uh, wind farms are areas where they have many, many of these wind turbines in the same same region, right? Uh, but there are a few issues that, that have been associated with wind turbines. First of all, bird and bat mortality. Uh, you know, big giant swinging blade in the sky isn't something a bird or a bat necessarily is programmed to watch out for. So around these, often birds of prey and bats end up uh, 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 dying around these wind farms. You also need an area of consistent wind. Mountains, coastal plains are great areas uh, to put these, right? They are an eyesore. Uh, people do not like them in their backyard. They can have big loud noises. If you can imagine if somebody put this up in your backyard and all you heard all day and night was whoosh, 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 right? Another uh, issue is you have to build these things on the ground and then stand them up so you have to level at least five acres of ground basically to erect each of these windmills. Uh, and these are still operated by energy companies that don't always have the best practices, that don't always pay the people they're supposed to pay. Right? Another one that has come into uh, very popular use is geothermal power. And this is using heat contained within the earth. And just like solar, there's two ways to use this. One is to create electricity with it. Uh, you, this groundwater, this, this you know, hydrothermal uh, groundwater uh, is used to, to uh, turn into steam, to spin a turbine, to create electricity. Uh, you can also use it for space heating by piping these up through radiators into a building. In Iceland, 90% of the homes use this geothermal heating to, uh, uh, to heat their house. It's a very cheap way to heat your house. Right? Uh, another interesting um, uh, uh, energy generation that's coming online is ocean energy, right? Using using wave and, and energy uh, stored in the ocean. So this first one is ocean thermal energy conversion. This uses heat stored in the ocean, takes those warm surface waters and deep cold water. They're both collected via different tubes. The temperature difference between these uh, drives a turbine and then creates electricity. Right? And another really cool one that lots of people have been looking at recently is tidal power, using the, the, the power of the tides, right? So tides move vast amount of water. If we can tap into that energy, that, that kinetic energy, uh, we'd have a you know, very renewable, almost unlimited source of energy. Um, again, these are used to generate electricity. You can have a tidal barrage, which is where you create a barrier around an inlet, and you have a couple 
tubes that, that uh, uh, let water in and out, funnel the water through there, right? Uh, and then there's a turbine in there. As the water moves in and out, it spins that turbine. The issue is it's a barrier to marine species and basically makes sushi out of fish so they get caught between those blades, right? But we also have tidal turbines, uh, which is more like you see here, which is just a turbine that's stuck out, you know, in the water. Um, and then as the tides come in and out, it turns these turbines, generates electricity, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, this is a really cool uh, a video, and I do hope you guys check this out. It's got a bunch of different new uh, interesting types of, of alternative energy that folks are looking into uh, right now. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, video. Have a great new week, folks.